Great. We're going to start with our second set of the community pitch. Today. We have five pitches. Again, if you have questions, please do not hesitate to reach out either online via Slack uh, or in person here uh, at the team meeting. So we're going to start it off with a previous um, and her share petition. So, hello everybody. I'm Hardik from Oblivious, working on anti granular. And today we'll be preparing for the next pandemic with the eyes of data science. So, we are very excited to announce our next hackathon, which is the Open DP hackathon. In this hackathon, we want to ask you a question. Can we track and trace the spread of a pandemic without sacrificing the privacy of individuals? So for this, as we are announcing on the OpenDP community event, we have special prizes for users who use only OpenDP and Pandas, which is built on OpenDP to get the results. Now you can scan this QR code to get more information about the hackathon. I'll just give you a brief overview of what the hackathon is all about. So basically, we are provided with two data sets. One data set is provided by an airline, which has information about the passengers on board the flight. The second information, the second data set is provided by the National Health Organization or the NHO, which has records of all the patients who gave a COVID test and whether it was positive or negative. Now the objective is to identify the flights whose passengers need to be informed and they need to be quarantined. So for this hackathon, we'll have a month's time and let's see who wins. So this hackathon is uh, will be within the anti-granular environment. So I'll just walk you through what anti-granular basically is. So as you all know, privacy tech is a very broad category. Within anti-granular, we focus on privacy enhancing technologies. We focus on break, uh, we focus on privatizing all the parts of the funnel that make up a process. For this, we have two kinds of privacy. Input privacy, so that the data is kept safe as it is, uh, as it is processed, and output privacy, to protect against the reverse engineering of inputs. Now, how do we approach this? For input privacy, we use secure enclaves. Secure enclaves are nothing but trusted execution environments. And for output privacy, most of you might have heard of, or heard of this term already. We use <laughs> differential privacy. So differential privacy is a mathematical for, uh, framework ensuring privacy of particular individuals within a data set. Now what are enclaves? Enclaves are hardware isolated environments which are tamper proof. They are opaque at runtime and transparent at build time. And this, they are secure end to end. So we know that the data is kept private in every step of the execution. Now you all might be thinking, this is all okay, secure environments and all of this, but this would put a lot of load on the data scientists working on it. They would have to learn new things and all of that. But that's not the case with anti-granular. With anti-granular, using just four characters, percentile, percentile aging, you can transform any written private, uh, any Python written code into anti-granulars environment. You just have to make a little bit change, a uh, few changes here and there, like determining the privacy, the epsilon and the deltas and all of it. And it's very easy. You can just transform any regular Python code into anti-granular code. Now within anti-granular, the data becomes inherently private. So you cannot access the granularity of the data or the record level information. So if you try to access it, for this, to make everything work, we support the best in class disclosure control frameworks so that only differential, differentially private results can be printed and exported back to your local session. So to get started, we can use uh, any of the most popular packages like OpenDP. Most of you might be familiar with it. Smart Noise and Diffrible. We also have multiple other packages like Pandas and Record Linkage. So you can uh, start with those two. So this is it from me. If you have any doubts or you want to talk about anti-granular, 
or anything about the hackathon, I'm right here in the back bench. So you can approach me. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so my name is Joe Neer. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Vermont, and I've been helping out with the educational working group with OpenDV. And one of the things we're working on is trying to collect educational resources. We want to build like a kind of lightly curated index of these things. Um, and so what we're looking for here, like I know there are other indices of educational resources. What we're looking here is not just like research stuff, papers, stuff for grad students. We're also looking for things like um, tutorials that teach non-technical audiences how to think about differential privacy, right? And things that teach um, people implementing systems who may not, you know, have done their PhD in differential privacy but need to write some code, uh, or even resources to help solve some of the problems from the panel that we just saw, right? Uh, that kind of thing would be really, really great. So there's a QR code there. Uh, I am not very experienced at making QR codes, so I hope it gets you to a Google form <laughs> where you can say, you know, here's here's a resource that I would suggest for this, for this index. Um, here's kind of the target audience and some comments on it. And then what we're going to try to do over the next few months is uh, kind of put together an index of these things uh, and kind of make it available on the OpenDP website. So please, anything you can think of, please submit it here. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And just to say, this is an active working group for OpenDP with Joe and Alex Smith and a couple other folks. So if you're interested in joining this educational working group, please let us know. Open door. Um, I got to find the people again. One moment. I can figure this out. It's not you, it's Zoom. Mike, find it. Hey, Mike. Hi. Hi, Mayana. Hello. Hey. There you go. And Holt. Oh, oh, I'm making this pretty. One second. Okay. Can you keep comments? Oh, that's not too good. Right, take okay. it away, guys. All right, so um, I'm Michael Shoemate. Um, I'm back again to talk about another project. Um, so I'm a co-author of a book called Hands on Differential Privacy. Um, my co-authors are Ethan, Ethan Cowan and Mayana Pereira, and they've also been my co-workers. Uh, Ethan at OpenDP and Mayana through Smart Noise at Microsoft. Um, generally speaking, we want to promote DP in the broader community and improve educational materials for practitioners. Um, the book is targeting data scientists and practitioners in a way that addresses the gap between conceptual understanding and applications. Um, and you'll notice that the animal is a deep slate urchin. Uh, it's somewhat reminiscent of the OpenDP logo because the book uh -huh. uses the OpenDP framework as a learning tool. Um, throughout the book, the style that we are using is to introduce a concept, um, provide some runnable code, and then either provide an annotated proof to enrich your understanding um, or, or where to find a proof. Uh, so we're trying to find a, a balance here where um, people who do not consider themselves mathematicians or, or, or even scared of math um, can still feel comfortable with the content in the book. Um, and at the same time, you also want to you know, cultivate a fundamental understanding of differential privacy uh, and that requires some discussion of the math. Um, so uh, we make the process as easy as possible. Uh, each step of uh, mathematical parts are, are heavily annotated to keep them connected with intuition. Um, and I've, 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 the, on the left side is a rough chapter listing 
the names are shortened um, and, and could be adjusted still. Um, at a high level, the first half of the book builds up a foundation of understanding. It's a, it's a collection of stable algorithms, um, private algorithms, measures of privacy, and it's connected together in a uh, mostly continuous narrative. Um, what's the relationship between one mechanism and the next? What are the drawbacks to one approach and how does it motivate the next mechanism or measure of privacy? Um, the second half of the book is more deep dives into specific domains. Um, what kinds of stable transformations you might want to use when you're working with tabular databases and SQL um, and how you apply DB algorithms that you're not familiar with from the first half of the book to, um, to build statistical models or DPSGD or synthetic data sets. Um, the latter part also covers some privacy attacks, um, talk about choosing privacy parameters with a um, invited author, Jay Sri uh, Sarathi, uh, and uh, finish with uh, some practical information about uh, deploying DP uh, and how you uh, apply it to uh, your project. So it's a book where um, it's slated to be published by O'Reilly in the spring. Uh, we've asked a number of um, people here in the audience for reviews, um, and we'll continue to incorporate those comments uh, as we work on finalizing the content of the book. Um, send me a message if you're interested in being a reviewer, and I'll um, try and push an updated pre-release out to you early next week. Um, we're really wanting to stay in touch with the community here and uh, get good feedback. So um, I'd like to hear your your uh, opinions and, and um, responses. Thanks. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mike. Luca, you. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm trying to figure out how to see you. There you are. Hold on. <laughs> awesome. Oh gosh, where can I put you that it's not on top of anything? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, that All right. Okay. And go. <laughs> yeah. Um. So hi everyone. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. I'm uh, Luca Canale. I'm a research engineer at uh, Sarus. And uh, today I would like to speak about how the recent open sourcing of uh, pre-trained LLMs can really change the game uh, for differential privacy synthetic data. Um, so of course, there is a lot of enthusiasm in the machine learning community about LLMs because of all the application they can be used for, uh, such as, uh, I mean, NLP tasks, uh, content generation, conversational AI. 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 So the problem is that uh, at the same time, it has been shown that uh, such models can uh, really memorize training data. And so this is a huge uh, problem because uh, you have privacy leaks. And there, so naturally comes the differential privacy to solve the problem. And there has been a lot of uh, great uh, research on this. Uh, the only problem is that uh, up until recently, we only had a small uh, pre-trained model available. And so when they were fine-tuned with differential privacy, you would do, lose a lot of the performances you, that you would have without it. And so today I would like to show you that uh, with a big pre-trained uh, LLM like uh, LAMA2, we can reach uh, good performances with a reasonable budget. Uh, reasonable budget meaning uh, epsilon equals 10 for delta equals 10 to the minus five. So the, the experiment is the following. Uh, we take four uh, pre-trained models. Two are for the from the old generation GP22s of different sizes, and then we take the uh, two Lama models, the seven billion parameters and the thirteen one, uh, and we have the IMDb dataset, with, uh, cons which consists in reviews with a positive or negative label. So we take a test set out, and with the rest of the data, we concatenate the text and. <laughs> And we fine tune each of the models uh, with DPSGD. So in the curve of uh, in the second figure, you can see uh, the, <clears throat> the fine tuning. 
Basically, each curve is one uh, fine tuning, and at each training step, we compute the corresponding epsilon. So, that <coughs> at the end of training, we are at epsilon equal 10. Uh, and you have two findings from here. The first one is that at the end of training, you have a much better, uh, smaller loss for uh, Lama 2, which means that the model is learning more. And also, it's not very clear here, but if you look carefully, you see also that the decrease is much bigger for Lama 2, which means that it learns also faster. Uh, and then with each of the models, we, you can uh, sample and uh, create uh, the synthetic samples. So there you can see uh, an example of Lama 2. Uh, but actually, we wrote a blog post. You have the QR code uh, in the right bottom corner, where you can also find the GPT-2's uh, samples. What you will see is that they both sp speak about film and movies, but uh, GPT-2 does not correlate the uh, review with the uh, label, while Lama 2, 2 does. Uh, so it's, it really seems that Lama 2 is much better. And so to evaluate this more uh, quantitatively, what we do is that uh, we want to look at a downstream task like classification. So for each of the samples, we will train a BERT classifiers on it to predict the review, either positive or negative. So we do this on each of the synthetic samples, and we do that also on the real data. And then each of the classifier is uh, evaluated on the test set that we removed at the very beginning. So it's not used neither in the fine tuning nor in the classifier uh, training. And so there you have the results. What you can see is that uh, you start with the smallest model where basically you're just a little bit better than random guessing because the accuracy and the f of one score is just above 0 0.5. And then the bigger the model, the better it goes. And when you go, when you arrive to Lama 2, you basically have almost the same performance as the classifier trained on the real data. So this is super exciting because it means that uh, DP actually training is practical because what I didn't say is that here in both the fine tuning with DP and the uh, the training of the classifier, we didn't really uh, tune so much deeper parameters. We just followed uh, what the literature advised for uh, DPSG deep. Uh, and so you can really use these uh, DP uh, synthetic uh, samples for downstream tasks. So of course, this is uh, quite a simple example, uh, but we're also testing more uh, complicated setups. And we would love to put together new use cases, both with researchers and uh, industrials. So if you're interested, you can just send me an email. It's uh, right on the corner. And we have also integrated this uh, LLM fine tuning in our uh, in a beta version of our product. So you can subscribe. There's the link, and uh, we can uh, we can make you a demo. Uh, so this is it. Thank you for uh, your time. Now, Hi, right, everybody. I'm uh, Hari from Thought Labs. Um, and um, our ask is uh, for your insights on helping to scale DP. Um, and, uh, you know, what we do, we're a startup, we help organizations really deploy and scale end to end official privacy, especially for high stakes data releases. Our customers are the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, the IRS, uh, and if you were at TPDP yesterday, you also heard about the work we've been doing with, with uh, Wikimedia. And so what we have found is that when it comes to actually adopting and scaling end-to-end -end differentially private workflows, um, all of our clients need more tools than just differentially private libraries. Um, and these workflows actually involve more personas than just users of these libraries. Uh, your libraries are great. We make one ourselves, Compton Analytics. Uh, and as Jerome mentioned, uh, you know, we've come to a point now where there's multiple libraries. There's Compton Analytics, there's OpenDP, there's DiffCrivlet. There are people analyzing the usability of these libraries. So Joe and, and team over here, Ivy, are, are doing great work. These libraries are really, really great for the data scientist persona. They really do address key pain points for data scientists, especially on how to ensure that data scientists can write uh, differentially private programs accurately, correctly, efficiently, and so on. But when it comes to scaling end-to-end -end differentially private workflows, what we have found is that every single client that we work with 
the personas involved, as you begin to make these decisions, it's not just a data scientist having to make these decisions. These decisions necessarily involve collaborations and consultations with folks like a data products director you know, and a chief privacy officer. And the questions that they are concerned about aren't necessarily just about the program. It's about how do we actually even define the utility metrics that we, are, we care about? How, you know, how do we actually quantify privacy risk? What does that mean for us? As Sarah said earlier, like, there's a specific context in the setting. So how do we make these decisions? How do we visualize these decisions? Um, how do we deploy these algorithms you know, to our cloud infrastructure in our own data environment? And then often, it's not just one data product or one data release. There's often hundreds of data releases that an organization has to manage or data products. And each of those products might have daily releases. So how does the organization actually track privacy budget, privacy risk across all these releases? So it turns out in every single case that we have actually helped to deploy, we've had to build custom tools above and beyond these libraries. And these tools involve things like integrating with other pets, uh, in, in involve custom error reports, whether there's Excel sheets or using Looker, you know, involves making sure that we work in, in cloud environments and advising and consulting with these organizations on how they can work together on sharing budgets you know, across and share data across different teams and so on. Now, we know we're not alone in this. We know there's a lot of you also working on these things. So what we want to do, we, what, what we're doing at Tumult is we're actually building the next generation of end-to-end -end workflow solutions. Um, and we'd love to have the community actually come together and share insights and share those insights back with the community. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, we are actually going to um, form the inaugural uh, community working group on usability. Uh, and we would love to seed that community working group with your insights from actually working with end-to-end -end deployment. So for example, what custom tooling have any of you actually had to build on top of a differentially private library in order to help decision makers visualize privacy related trade-offs? So Priyanka's work is absolutely great here, but we definitely want to include insights from that. But we're curious to know, like, what other examples are there? You know, if you could share those. And these don't have to be super sophisticated, right? Like, Priyanka's work sets the bar pretty high. Like, a lot of our customers use simple CSV sheets with, like, just matrices with color coding in there. That's great, too. Please share those with us. If there's tooling that you've had to develop and then found yourself, like, challenged to develop the tooling was just so much you had to give up, Please share that insight as well. What obstacles did you find really insurmountable? We, as a community, need to know where the really big challenges are that you might start out thinking, oh, that's got to be pretty easy to build a tool around that, right? And then you find out, no, actually, here there be dragons. We would like to know what those dragons are. What other pains or personas have you encountered? I think so far, you know, we really have been so super focused on people like us. Data scientists, programmers, science, you know, researchers really, really know that they want to work too about differential privacy. There are a whole set of other personas that we really need to think about and understand their user experience uh, of tools beyond libraries. So we'd love to hear your pain points and your personas as well. So that's our ask. There's a QR code there. There's a there's a link, uh, Bitly uh, DP Workflow Insights. Um, and on the forum, I just added uh, today a little question at the very end. If you'd like to actually join the new community working group on usability, uh, please let us know. And we'd love to have yours. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll make sure that we share these findings back with all of us, because the more that we can move together, uh, the more organizations can actually benefit. Thanks. Thank you.